I'm Chuck D'Antonio, and uh, this is CC O'Connor. We're going to be talking about how we're working to build a cloud native compliance culture at, uh, at Boston Scientific, where, where CC works. Mm -hmm. First, a little bit about us. I'll start. A uh, little bit of my, stole from my Twitter bio here, but uh, I'm a swimmer, a dad, a yogi, love great cocktails. Um, anyone who wants to talk about barrel aged cocktails after, it's kind of a little bit of a passion of mine, so uh, we can catch up on that. Cool. I'm Cece. I'm a product manager from Boston Scientific and our digital health incubator. Some fun facts about me. I love dogs. I do not have one, so I gratuitously mooch off my friends with dogs. Uh, and I have a twin brother, Steve. I'm literally surrounded by Steves all day. My pair, the guy who sits next to me, my engineer. So when I say, hey, Steve, I get at least two people saying hey at the same time. Uh, and I like to volunteer with some after school programs like the Cambridge Inventors Club in Boston, which is hosted by one of the pivots in the labs. It's a really cool place teaching kids like software engineering soft skills. But today we're here to talk to you a bit about our transformational journey and kind of how we are moving forward and determining what is the right thing for us to build at this time. So a bit about Boston Scientific, we're a very, very large multinational organization deeply rooted in a highly regulated environment. So we affect a lot of people. We've got over 24 million patients a year, right? In over 100 countries, that's a lot of things. We're a very large enterprise, and there's a lot of products to consider, right? And how do we continue to develop? And that's kind of where we're, what's fueling this transformational journey. And so our next thought is, how do we make this happen, right? So we partner with Pivotal Labs. Yeah, we got started earlier this year in February. It was kind of a different thing, I think, for me, having seen some of these things, like all the, you know, talking and them saying, like, you know, potentially, you know, our software actually runs inside someone's body, right? <laughs> and it's, uh, I worked on a trading floor. They thought their stuff was life and death, but this stuff really is. So it was a, a big change for me. Uh, we got started in February. We started doing some work with Pivotal Labs. And all along, we've had this sense that um, what we really need to focus on is what does it look like to be compliant in a regulated environment um, when we're trying to move fast. Boston Scientific, much like other companies, who work with regulators and whose products really can't go to market without regulatory approval um, has to move at different paces for different parts of what they're doing. Um, so if we start adopting a lean product approach and we start trying to put products out in the market in that style that need to go through potentially multi-year regulatory regimes, uh, what's it going to look like? How are we going to do things? And so we looked at how do we look at continuous compliance to add into what we're doing with continuous integration, continuous delivery? Mm -hmm. So first step is like flexing those continuous integration, continuous deployment muscles, right? We are moving to a much more in-house developed model. And so if the first thing we wanted to do is prove that we could do that. And day one, I rolled into labs and I saw, oh my god, my team is doing so many cool things. I, I came a little bit later than everyone else, right? And people were like, we can do so much stuff. We move so quickly. I'm building great things. And I was like, wow, this is a little intimidating, right? I'm coming from a very waterfall, a waterfall methodology environment. And I have this traditional experience with software validation through software validation documentation, right? And you kind of view it almost as this like monolith experience. You write these packages and you validate things and you move through these steps. And, and is that really the best way that we continue to grow as an enterprise organization if we want to further develop our product offerings? So big disclaimer, like no products that we're currently developing right now actually interface with our quality or compliance space because we are just kind of iterating and developing a skill in-house. But this is how we really thought about what is the next best thing for us to fuel our transformational growth. And if we want to really expand this, we need to think about if we want continuous com integration and continuous deployment, we really need something along the lines of continuous uh, compliance. So the important part, right? We talked, we're a medical device company. We touch important things. We touch important people. Everyone's important. And our devices are used in patients throughout their care journey. And we will not accept risk that is inappropriate in this journey. Um, and so how do we best mitigate that is really start to think in advance before we start even contemplating touching these things, what we need to do to ensure patient safety. And a lot of the times, compliance is directly integrated with that safety aspect of their life. 
So one of the real learnings that I've had in the past working in regulated environments, so I worked with the government, I worked in financial services, is that there's an enormous amount of folklore that builds up around what it means to be compliant. If you look at your procedures that you have to follow, those are based on sort of often layers of interpretation between the people who are reading and responsible and accountable to the regulators and the people who are implementing the practices and procedures that you're, um, that you're using to build software and to deploy software. Um, so one of the things that I've you know, sort of repeatedly come back to, and it's been kind of a fun experience to hear people at Boston Scientific say this back to me, is that we don't want to comply with the folklore. We want to make sure we comply with the regulations themselves. And that's one of the quickest ways to start to take some of that, um, some of that pain out of the process and to lean out the process of being compliant. Lots of the things that are wasteful in the current uh, regulatory and compliance capabilities within your organization are off, often come from this just sort of layers and layers of folklore that have happened. Um, one of the divisions made a joke that, you know, if it references uh, the area of the body we work with and it has our logo on it, we want to treat it to the highest regulatory standard possible, right? It was a joke that the person from that division was making to me, um, but it does sometimes represent how these things build up over time of, you know, it's, what you, you know, we want to do something because you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to put that, that safety first and, that and, and be compliant with the regulations. Uh, a lot of things build up there. Mm -hmm. And to that point, there's been a really great theme at this conference about challenging like the mysterious they. If anyone went to Emily Tate's talk or the bad parts of Agile and always asking why. And so on this journey, we ask why, but we also ask where. So where is this standard? Where is this written? Where is this regulation? And how can I iterate on this thing? And so for us to begin this journey, we really wanted to partner with quality from the beginning. So we brought them on site. We took them on tours. We really like opened up the curtains and were like, this is exactly what I'm doing. And what do I need to do to alleviate your concerns and address your needs? And make sure that we're kind of balancing those things and developing product in a great fashion, right? Like so those are big concerns. Just to interject there, you said the word quality there. When we use the word quality, that's actually what the compliance team yeah. at Boston Scientific is called because they focus on, on the overall manufacturing quality of everything that's developed, software, hardware, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so CC and I will use that word regularly, but if you're in a, a another, uh, another industry or you have a different name for it, it, just think of it as your compliance group. Thanks. Yep. So when I say where, I'm also interested in where that originates from, right? Not just where does it exist in-house. So we have these existing SOPs, which were written at a different time with different frameworks in mind and different capabilities. And if we are fleshing out these capabilities, we really need to be reassessing with those standards and regulations definitely in mind. Uh, how do we address those needs? And to do that, we need to go to like the true source and involve them in that discussion and think about how does this affect things from all angles. Yeah, one of the important things to do is to make sure this comes from the top down and the bottom up because it's always great to have that air cover, but it, you know, there's often the person you're going to be talking with who's looking at your project is not the person who you've gone to and said at the top levels, like how can we, you know, and gotten support for making changes. So you really need to bring people from both levels through. Um, and not just focus on either talking to the people who are, you're dealing with directly who, you know, even if they can make the decisions, may not be supported in those decisions, or talking to the people who are going to set direction who might say, yeah, yep, great direction, we can, do it, we can do this in a more lean way. And then when you're actually ready to be reviewed, uh, you find out that that message hasn't trickled down. Right. And that's also a really important aspect of being a PM, right, is stakeholder management and finding yourself those advocates and then leveraging them to kind of spread that word around. And you'll find that people are really interested in doing this kind of thing because it's a cool process and it's, it's improving the way that we deliver care, right? So it's very interesting. And, and you might assume, right, incorrectly, I assure you, that um, they aren't as fast and forward moving as we are, but you might then in turn find out that people in your own organization literally wrote the industry guidance on how you do the thing that suddenly you just realized is magical. Um, and so how do you leverage those people to um, work with those who are a little bit more concerned and make sure that you're hearing all those voices and connecting all those pieces? And, and in this compliance journey, we want to think about compliance not as just an afterthought, but really as a product in itself. So how can I deliver compliance as a product to my patients, my quality and regulatory groups, and my team itself? Because that's a risk, and we need to like 
integrate those processes into our day-to-day. -day. So one of the important things we did was that um, Cece and her predecessor, who had, was playing a similar role uh, and, and, until she stepped into it, they did a lot of work of going back and reading the regulations, reading the guidance around the regulations, and really trying to deeply understand what the regulations were saying and why they were saying it. And as we brought people through, we mentioned the tours in the previous slide, as we brought people through Pivotal Labs and talked to them about our practices who were in the quality organization, um, you know, talking about test-driven development, talking about the idea of um, lean, product, uh, lean product design and only building the things that were actually needed, that's actually one of the central things in the regulatory environment that these guys work in. Right? The, the, um, they, you're supposed to build only the software that's explicitly requested. Right? You don't want extra software in a pacemaker or in the system that talks to a pacemaker. Right? You, you need to have only the software that's requested built. So that's what's required by the regulations. So you, you build exactly what you, what's specified. Well, that sounds an awful lot like what's going on with lean product development. Right? When, when a team comes in and starts working and they're doing um, they're building to exactly what's required right now and they're building a test and they're only building the software that makes the path the test pass, basically all these modern practices are built exactly around that, right? The idea of quality and building a quality product that does exactly what it's supposed to be is exactly what modern practices are built around. It's just that some of these regulatory regimes haven't seen this before. So there's other stories sort of around that. So as we brought in <laughs> sort of the head of quality for the organization and brought him around on a tour, he was really excited by pairing because he saw that people were getting independent review constantly. He was really excited by TDD. He was really excited by the fact that um, when we look and we say to an engineer, like, here's what, you're going, you know, here's what your outcomes need to be, here's the solution you're working on, they build only what is asked for, because that's exactly what is behind all of the regulations that he's been working with for years, even though a whole lot of other stuff is built up around how to do that. Mm -hmm. Very accurate. And so, as you mentioned before, this is something you really want to do together. Like, you never want to dictate to quality the things that you believe are compliant or the way to address that need, right? Because they actually are the ones who are much more conversant in that, and they can help guide you in those things. So you really need to consider, like, who should be the decision maker and who should be the product owner and who should have that engagement throughout this process. Um, and so we spent a lot of time, so we have this, we talk a little bit about the mapping, and, that's, and we put a mapping together. We sat down actually with specific standards and regulations, and we put together a spreadsheet. Um, I was in the sessions with CC's predecessor when we did this, and we went through this mapping, and we said, here's the practice that we do that we think is the best fit for this. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a three-day session. I actually only sat in for about four hours. Um, I kind of considered myself lucky, um, because it's, it's tough work, right? And you're, you're reading, language that's often difficult to work with uh, in the regulation and whatever guidance is around it, you're sitting with someone who said, for example, like, well, we've always built a specification and had that specification validated and then done an architecture review. And you're saying, well, we write a story and then we write a test and then we make the code pass that test. Um, and so trying to draw together like these disparate areas can be uh, a, a, an intense process. What was surprising for me during the time that I did sit in was that it wasn't painful. Um, I was, you know, as you mentioned, some people assume that these people aren't going to want to change, right? Their job is to keep the organization safe from um, some sort of censure from the government, that change would be something they would be afraid of. The most surprising thing for me as I met with more and more people in the quality team at Boston Scientific was how open they were to um, changing the folklore and going just to the regulation, keeping the, keeping the patient safe and the organization safe by doing what the regulation intended rather than what they'd been doing for a long time. So we put together this mapping and then we brought the mapping to the first team that we worked with. Even though that team was working on something that was health software rather than medical device software, which are kind of the two areas that we talk about, right? Health software is as broad as like, you know, Apple Health and your Fitbit and things like that. Um, and medical device software gets into like that stuff that actually communicates with your body. Um, we were still like looking at these practices and looking at these mappings with the team that was doing that work um, so that we could sort of validate that it would happen within the context of the project the way we were doing it. Yep, and I think that's also a fine line as, as we are expanding and exploring and furthering the development of our opportunities here, you need to really be pairing with your quality and regulatory groups because they can help direct you how to best mitigate your risk. And that is a really important thing, as well as uh, maintaining a 
synonymous language. So we walk in and we really need to do the upfront research a little bit to understand what they're saying and then also saying like, hey, what is this term? And does it really mean this thing? And how can we kind of mesh together on these aspects? So as we want to push to prod, right, we think about the path to production and what are the aspects that we need to map out. Where do we have our regulatory check-ins? Who are the people we need to prove in these, or have as approvers in these processes? What is the existing uh, steps that we do in-house? So since we did this as lab, there's labs, there was a lot of stickies. Yep. Um, and the team, um, the first application we built was for people with um, inflammatory bowel diseases. So the team had a nickname of Team Hanky. Um, there were way too many jokes and um, emojis that were troubling for me not being in grade school anymore. Um, but they, uh, the team had, had a lot of fun with it. And, and um, so Team Hanky, getting to production and to their, their, their users and customers. We had sort of process goals, we had technical goals. You can see there's an enormous amount of technical things in the path to production, excuse me, process things in the path to production that we mapped out and very few technical things. Uh, so uh, what we had to do is sort of look at this like a value stream and think of you know, what if these things are adding value to, in terms of the value we're looking for here, which of course is patient safety and, um, and the qual their quality of life. Uh, even though this, again, this wasn't something that was going to directly impact patient safety, that's the value we're always looking at when we're working on software. Um, and we took that mapping and we used that to negotiate and navigate what we were doing here. So the navigation was simply like, hey, based on this mapping that we did, can we just pull a process step off the wall? Um, and we found a few of those. And then the negotiation aspect was sort of having communications. Um, so Cece and her pair came up with a way, for example, um, to bring a new feature to the quality team um, in terms of like getting a quick approval for what it was doing that was very different than what we did before. Mm -hmm. And that's just through constant communication and demos, for example, and keeping people in the loop at like what features you are delivering at what times and constantly having that dialogue so that you are sure you are moving forward in a safe manner, right? That's really what it's all about. Um, yeah. And, and one of the main principles we had was that we wanted to make sure that we automated everything. Um, so our talk today isn't really focusing on the technology. I'll talk about it a little bit towards the end. But the idea was that it, we were going to need to automate everything that we did. So um, if it was, there was a process they had where they were sort of sending a screenshot off to be looked at. Um, and you know, we, we had to look at, well, can we automate that? How do we, can we generate that out of something? I don't know if you guys ended up actually automating that or not, but I know we had some discussion around that at the beginning. Um, how do we look at generating documentation um, in terms of tooling that will generate that? Um, but you know, just like all of our build steps were going to be automated, we needed to automate um, all of our steps through uh, as we went through. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So really, like the goal is essentially embedding all of these great practices into your day to day, and a lot of the things that we do with Pivotal are safe, and our industry guidance points, like acceptance test-driven development. You might not know this, but that actually counts for your intended use statement and your acceptance um, criteria. So that's your requirement, your test. And previously, in a very waterfall world, we have to individually document those things in some large document. And then it's very hard to make those shifts and those pivots when all those things are categorized together. Sorry, I have a cold. Um, paired programming. It decreases a lot of risk. It decreases a lot of bugs in your code, it increases your efficiency and your ability to cycle on things. And when we talk about how we add value, right, we talk about the build, measure, learn cycle. And so that is an awesome way to iterate on that. And just constantly thinking about what those things that we need to think about are. And I say critical thinking because you need to constantly be assessing what is this feature doing? Does this feature increase risk in a way that we want to really think about specifically? And then how do we mitigate that risk? So that's like an additional feature at the same time simultaneously and then documenting what those failure modes are so that we have clear visibility and kind of tagging throughout that discussion. Um, some of the things, one of the things I found really interesting as we were sort of looking at embedding practices was that actually sometimes I felt like we were generating too much, right? We had discussions about how do we present to, um, and this is open, honestly still an open question for us, so it'd be fun to chat about sort of after, um, after the event, you know, after the talk and after the event. Um, how do we, when we're, present, when we're running tests, potentially dozens, dozens of times a day, how do we present test results to the regulator? Right? They, in this, you know, 
when I worked in financial services, we never actually had to, we had to test our stuff, but we didn't have to show that we had tested mm -hmm. our stuff. In this model, we actually, in this business, we actually have to show that we validated things. Well, we could give them, you know, the output of 4,000 uh, executions of our unit tests, but how would they consume it? Um, and these are still sort of the open questions, some of the open types of questions that we have as to, you know, where now we know these practices are good for the, the intent of the regulations and even, even, even the, uh, the, the letter of the regulations, um, but still sometimes how we're gonna present it, how we're gonna allow it to be audited is gonna be uh, an interesting challenge for yep. us. And for reference, we do tag each test with a story ID, so we do allow for that visibility and that data exists within Concourse and GitHub, so we can access it. And to his point, there is a dialogue about how do we make this something that is human readable to someone who is not as familiar with software, right? I can't expect an auditor to come into the room and <coughs> see, wow, I really, I really get this piece of code does the thing that you say it does. Like, it, it's not a dialogue that they, we can't expect them to have, right? So we need to best prepare ourselves for that part of the journey. Right, and we, and by the same token, you know, our green pipeline doesn't mean much to them either, right? So there's somewhere in the middle that's what we're going to have to demonstrate. Um, we are pulling uh, a lot of different tooling together, doing a lot of experimentation. We've done um, some implementation on the pro projects that we've done, um, but of course we have to treat this in a lean way as well. So since we're not at the point where we're getting to really highly regulated systems right now, we're basically just doing spikes and having discussions. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is sort of our core tool set has started to emerge. We're using Tracker and we're using uh, Bitbucket, and those are integrated so that we're seeing um, story, you know, we're tagging uh, commits with story numbers and we're getting the, the integration together there. Um, and that actually f meets the traceability goal that's in the regulations that we're working with. Mm -hmm. um, we're using PCF, so we're getting, you know, the security that comes along with PCF and validating PCF once uh, for all of the applications that we deploy out to PCF. Um, through these pipelines. Uh, Vericode scanning has been part of the practices of Boston Scientific. What was really exciting uh, and, and shocking, quite frankly, to some of the developers and, and managers on the Boston Scientific team was that um, they had a clean uh, run through Vericode of the first uh, build, uh, for, you know, first sort of released build of this first product that we built. And it was the first time that had ever happened in that organization that it had gone through Vericode clean once. So, you know, we have these little experiences like that that help build up the story, showing that these things are successful and working, right? Showing that quality is coming out of these practices, and then you can sort of build those. As you get that trust, you can build that trust more as you put things together. Another thing we're exploring is using uh, compliance masonry for uh, generating documentation, right? The history around compliance masonry is, is generating a lot of security documentation and things like that. We still need those. Right? Uh, FDA doesn't say specifically what you should do for security, but it's also always safe to follow the NIST standards because if the government's checking your security and the government's producing a security standard, probably a good place to start. Um, and so we started looking at how do we use compliance masonry for that and how do we create additional controls within the open control framework for the things that we are doing specifically uh, with the software we produce. And then of course the practices sort of play in too. The, so the lean product management, it makes sure that we're, um, we're building exactly what we're supposed to, to, supposed to. CC mentioned the intended use statement, which is a, a you know, really necessary thing in this area. Behavior-driven development and acceptance test-driven development really drive that. Um, continuous integration and delivery, we're getting our tests all the time. Again, we're, that's almost producing too much information for our regulators. And then, of course, all of this is fitting for us into the concept of compliance as code. How much can we do in terms of documenting compliance uh, through the code that we're writing, right? And, and, you know, we're open to sort of where does this go from here? Like, we could maybe incorporate Structurizer and start sort of doing modeling in code if there's groups within the organization that say, hey, we need to at least show some pictures of how this works as part of sort of our submissions uh, for approval. So this journey is continuing. Um, so there's kind of a few things that are, that are next, and I think CC can tell you a little bit about what, uh, what they're doing. Yep. So we're running up to staff a team to start a product journey, right, to develop this pipeline and to really think about how best might we address this need in this particular model. And that is something I'm particularly very excited about. And through that, we're definitely leveraging Concourse and as you mentioned, so like I said GitHub earlier, but that was wrong. Um, and Pivotal Tracker to get that full traceability to create some kind of human readable artifact 
and to provide assurance to our organization that as we continue to grow, we're doing it in the safest possible manner and continuing to respond to changes. So I was joking with Chuck earlier today that like, we mapped out a bunch of these uh, FDA regulations that are in scope, but the FDA is always changing. It might change not as quickly as some people might think, but literally two hours ago, they released three different um, guidances on new industry governance regarding health software, non-medical device software, med device software, and how they're enabling innovation in this space. So I think it's a really great time to begin this discussion. Yeah, we actually got a note from CC's VP saying, can you guys read this before your <laughs> talk? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we were polishing up the slides, so we couldn't, but uh, <laughs> she gave it a quick scan at least. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of this too is sort of making sure that this product team that CC's kicking off can, um, can really productize this. How do we get these things into the uh, hands of teams in the organization? How do we help them to understand that there's a new work, they use, we use, they use this term sort of work system or work standard a lot, um, and I don't actually know if that's a regulatory term or just a Boston scientific term, but how do we make sure that people understand there's a new work system, there's a new standard, um, they're working in, you know, if they're working in a different way, what do they have to do, right? Something as simple as make sure you include a story number in your git commits is something that might be new to, um, even to the, quite frankly, even to I think some of the pivots that we're, we're working on this team, you know, they, they do that if the customer thinks they should and don't necessarily if the customer doesn't talk about it. Um, so we're continuing to expand that system, doing the education we need to do so that product teams can pick it up, um, incorporate it, making sure that we can do things like generate their pipelines for them if we're creating a set of pipelines, you know, can we have a yeoman generator that gives them their pipelines and a, and a, f a framework for their project around it. Um, I think there's one more because uh, this seems to be pretty consistent for, uh, uh -huh. for Spring One. We're definitely hiring, so reach out. <laughs> um, yeah, if you want to chat afterwards if anyone is interested, but I don't know if we have time for questions. Just real quick on that too, geographically. Oh, uh, primarily uh, Boston-centric area. And then some Minneapolis too, we're standing up yep. some teams there. Um, those are kind of the two main places I think you guys have IT, at least that we've been working with so far. In the US. There are some folks out here, and there are some folks down in uh, Valencia and Southern California as well. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Well, Any thank questions? you. Could you talk a little bit more about pipeline generation for compliance? Sure. So the question, if we could talk a little more about uh, pipeline generation for compliance. So um, we're in a situation right now where we can put together a model pipeline that says, you know, we want to go through these steps. We want to submit the code to Veracode, right? We've, we've actually done a spike that uses SonarCube just because it's easier for walking around and talking about than, than worrying about the Veracode charging by line of code process. process. Um, so, okay, so we've got a model pipeline. Do we just tell teams that, hey, it's over here, download it and incorporate it into your project? Because we want to make sure that pipeline's in the code of the project itself. Um, or should we be generating out those pipelines for them or maybe giving them a generator that says, you know, here's your Spring Boot or your J-Hipster or your Node uh, generation and we will put those compliance pipelines in it that will have the steps like running compliance masonry to do documentation that will have the steps like loading the code up to Veracode uh, or, you know, in our spike that we're walking around with, uh, SonarCube. And, um, and then additional steps that we may add, you know, let's make sure we make sure the behavior tests run, let's make sure we make sure that the, um, if, we, you know, if we decide that there's the pos potential for people doing architecture diagrams, that we make sure that Structurizer runs and generates some documents from, uh, some architecture diagrams from code. But um, I think the hardest thing to, uh, for this to take hold will be the teams knowing that it's there and not sort of building their own uh, capabilities around uh, the pipelines that they need, um, or uh, going too far and sort of saying, unless you have all of these steps, you will never get to our Cloud Foundry environment, right? Uh, you know, and there's, there's a balance to strike there. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll take the architecture diagram uh, model. There is no harm is going to happen to other people on the plat digital health platform if someone doesn't draw an architecture diagram. Right? But if they don't do a Veracode scan, potentially it could. So we'd probably say if you have no Veracode scan, you cannot deploy to the platform. But we're probably not going to say if you don't have an architecture diagram, mm -hmm. um, you can't. And, and I say we because I'm advising them. It would be them that would be saying. Yeah. And then also as we um, continue to build out our platform, we're also writing it as similar as AI wants so that, and then using the Gherkin model so that we attribute 
the intended use statement, the uh, acceptance test driven criteria, and also that visibility to how we build that pipeline. So there's traceability to um, the verification and validation throughout the development of that pipeline and as we continue to roll it out. So we're at time, uh, thanks for coming. And um, the one benefit we have of being at the very end of the conference is that um, we can stick around and answer questions for as long as you'd like. So thanks. All right, thanks.